Welcome everyone to the Applied Plant Sciences Seminar Series. I am honored today to introduce our speaker, Kate Fessler. Kate is a master's student in the Applied Plant Science Program at the University of Minnesota under the supervision of Drs. Emily Hoover and Neil Anderson. She grew up outside of Detroit, Michigan on her family's small alpaca farm. A 2018 graduate from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, she has a degree in biological sciences with a concentration in sustainable foods. She is a former Fulbright fellow who has lived and worked in Finland, Ireland, Peru, and the United States on projects ranging from apple orchard renovation to wildlife conservation. Her current project is assessing the efficacy of a tabletop strawberry production system for Minnesota's climate. Kate will begin her seminar in a moment, but I would first like to remind everyone that you can enter questions in the chat or Q&A throughout the presentation, and they will be answered after the talk. You can also raise your hand after the presentation if you'd like to be able to unmute and ask your question live. And with that, I will turn things over to Kate. Okay. Thank you so much for your introduction, Matthew, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, on this really beautiful Minnesota spring day. So the title of my talk today is Assessing the Efficacy of a Tabletop Strawberry Production System for Minnesota. And again, I'm Kate and my advisors are Drs. Emily Hoover and Neil Anderson. And right away at the beginning, I want to thank Lindsay Miller for her contributions as she is the person who took the vast majority of the beautiful photos that you'll see in this presentation today. So just to start off with a little bit of background about our project and our pilot season, this is a Minnesota Department of Agriculture grant collaboration between Drs. Emily Hoover, Neil Anderson, and Steve Poppy, who is a researcher at the West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris, Minnesota. This was actually inspired by some Canadian growers that Steve went and visited in Ontario, and their system is the one that you can see on the left here. This project's main aim is to expand day neutral strawberry production in Minnesota, and our pilot season began about May of 2020. I arrived September of 2020, and the St. Paul system was installed in late September along Gortner Avenue on the St. Paul campus, and that's that aerial view that you can see here on the right. So these are the topics that I'll be covering in my talk today. I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction to the strawberry plant, and then I'll be talking about conventional strawberry crops and cropping systems before I get into some alternative production systems, and then talk specifically about tabletop strawberries and then my experimental design. So probably most of you have seen a strawberry plant before. Um, what you might not be aware of, though, are just some of the parts of the plant that I'll refer to later. So the strawberry plant has a crown, which is actually a compressed modified stem from which all roots and shoots arise. In this picture on the left, you can see branch crowns and that is, those are shoots um, which can actually give rise to more crowns for the plant. Strawberry plants can propagate vegetatively via runners that produce daughter plants. And they can also of course reproduce sexually via seeds from the strawberry fruits. And strawberry fruits are actually not berries, they're aggregate accessory fruits, which means that they're derived from the receptacle of the flower. And each seed is actually called an achene and it is individually fertilized. So those achenes then release auxin that allow the fruit to swell and fill. And you can also see here from this picture that strawberry plants have pretty shallow roots, which makes them light feeders and good for use in a relatively shallow media system like the tabletops which I'll talk more about later. It's just a little bit of history of cultivation. Strawberry plants are more recently domesticated, although not as recently as some other fruit crops like blueberries or cranberries. Um, they have been consumed in Europe since the Roman era. Meanwhile, in the Americas, they were domesticated about a thousand years ago by the Pacunche and Mapuche people of Chile. And commercially, they've only been grown in the US since about the 1860s. On the right, this drawing is from Germany from 1485. So it's one of the earliest drawings of strawberry plant that we have. And it is from the Hortus sanitatus. And then down here, you can see a figure from Liston et al 2014. And this shows the distribution of Fragaria species via ploidy. 
And so you can see that most species are concentrated in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see these little light pink dots down here represent Fragaria chiluensis. And Fragaria chiluensis is actually one of the parents of that strawberry fruit that is in commercial production in the US today. So the vast majority of the strawberries that all of you have probably eaten in your lives were Fragaria ex ananasa weston, which is a hybrid of Fragaria virginia Virginiana from North America and Fragari chiluensis from South America. So they were both brought over to a garden in Brittany where they were open pollinated and discovered. And the person who discovered them decided to keep them around because they made such beautiful fruits. So there are actually three different strawberry flowering types. There are June bearing types, sometimes also called short day or spring bearing cultivars, Danish cultivars, and then everbearing cultivars. I'm not going to talk really about everbearing cultivars because they're not commonly in commercial production, so they're not particularly relevant to the research here at the U that I've been conducting. So June bearing cultivars are distinguished by the fact that they initiate flower buds only once a year. So they initiate their flower buds in the fall when days are longer than four or shorter than 14 hours, and then they overwinter them, and then they open and flower and fruit in the spring or early summer. They are perennial, so they bear fruit for about three to five years. And their harvest time varies a lot with regions. With warmer regions, you can get an earlier harvest, whereas in Minnesota, generally speaking, the harvest is over by about the 4th of July. These are the strawberries, however, that are most commonly grown in Minnesota and in the upper Midwest in general. Day neutral cultivars, in contrast, produce throughout the seasons. They produce buds, flowers, fruits, and crunch branch crowns throughout the season, and they tend to be managed as annuals. They are not actually winter hardy in the same way that June bearing cultivars are because they were bred for California's climate. And that means that they've only recently been grown in Minnesota. Unfortunately, there are still some challenges with pests that are common in Minnesota. So there are still some issues with bugs like, tar or with pests like tarnished plant bug and with the more recent SWD or spotted winged Drosophila fly. So the main takeaway that I hope you'll take from this previous slide is that day neutral cultivars are really best for season extension. And actually they can add an average of 14 weeks to our growing season here in Minnesota. So some more recent history as well is the history of strawberry research at the U has really been all about weeds. So strawberries are really non-competitive in the wild, they're very happy to kind of grow in the undergrowth and then pop up and prop propagate more vegetatively, um, but that's really not ideal for commercial production, as I'm sure you can understand. There are very few chemical controls for weeds in strawberry crops, and strawberries are actually some of the fruit that you'll buy at the store that have the most residual pesticides, herbicides, et cetera, on them, and that makes pesticide-free control a pretty major goal. So like I mentioned before, the majority of the strawberries grown in, Michi or in Minnesota are June bearing perennials, which bear for three to five years. They produce that one crop in June. And to grow them, we use the perennial matted row system. So growers set the plants out, they let the runners grow out and they interweave to create a mat. The idea being that the mat suppresses weed germination. However, for the daughter plants to really thrive, they actually need less weed pressure during that establishment year so that the mats can grow nice and thick. So this is a photo of a June bearing cultivar trial in Morris, Minnesota. And you can note here these interwoven mats and then the straw between the rows. And here's a picture of that same cultivar trial and how it fared in terms of weeds. So you can see that that within row weed control can be very challenging. You might also be wondering with only one crop a year, what yield is like for these types of strawberries. And the answer is that it's relatively low. It's 8,500 pounds per acre per year compared to day neutral strawberries, which can get 22,000 pounds per acre per year. So that's almost two and a half times as high as for June bearing systems. And in terms of some of the projects that recent research or research grad students um, have worked on, there was Andy Petran working on organic day neutral production methods with Emily Hoover, and he now owns and operates Twin Cities Berry Co. 
there was Jared who worked on nutrient management for organic systems. And he was also working with Emily Hoover as well as Dr. Mary Rogers. Nathan Hecht, who was looking at pollinator strips to increase visits to strawberry plants, also working with Emily and Dr. Rogers. And now there's me working on the tabletop strawberry systems with Emily and Neil as my advisors. So just to summarize my introduction, strawberries have really been in commercial production for a very, or for a relatively short time, only since the 1860s in the US. Traditionally, research has really been about eating weeds and day neutral production is on the rise. So just a little bit about conventional strawberry crops and cropping systems. In terms of the global and domestic economic importance of strawberries, the top producers in the world are the US, Mexico, and China. And domestically, about 91% of strawberries are grown in California, 8% are grown in Florida, and then that remaining 1% are grown everywhere else, including Minnesota. Simultaneously, there has been a 300% increase in strawberry consumption in the last 40 years or so. And so strawberries are now among the top five most consumed fresh fruits in the country. So in addition to that increased strawberry consumption, we now know that two thirds of consumers are interested in buying local. And that's really evidenced by a 364% increase in farmers markets since the 80s and a pretty whopping 181,750% increase in community supported agriculture ventures. And CSAs are actually a production model where consumers can support small local producers by purchasing a share of the harvest in advance, and thereby also purchasing some of the risk commonly associated with farming edible crops. So a lot of small farms in Minnesota rely on this type of model. And I believe that this big percent increase is up from only four registered CSAs in the 1980s. And so really 48 out of 50 states can't meet local demand for strawberries. And that's because of course, that remaining 1% of production is allocated across all 48 of the remaining states. And that makes strawberries a really high value crop in Minnesota. So to put that phrase high value crop in Minnesota into context, it's helpful to look at some national averages. So these are retail prices nationally. The seasonal low price is about $2 per dry pint during the season for strawberries, so May and June. And then the seasonal high price is about $3 per dry pint, which is a 50% increase. And that's November through January when we're really in the depths of winter and nobody's seen a strawberry locally in a little while. In Minnesota, however, an actual high price that we've seen in that off season, AKA that 14 week extension between July and October with day neutral production was $8 per pound for local organic day neutral berries. So then to provide another little point of comparison, I'm just gonna talk briefly about current domestic production in California and Florida, which is pretty much year round using day neutrals. However, there are some pretty significant issues with soil-borne pests and pathogens, and most growers don't rotate their fields. Now, the reason why they've been able to do that in the past, and by do that, I mean not rotate their fields, is that they relied on soil fumigants to disinfest the soil, particularly methyl bromide, which is actually highly toxic. Um, it was banned in 2005, but was still being used as late as 2015. And it actually harms lungs and releases ozone damaging compounds into the atmosphere. There are also some, also some labor issues because harvest is pretty backbreaking and you need to six to nine pickers per acre. So in terms of current production in Minnesota, this should be pretty familiar to all of you by now. We use that perennial matted row or PMR system with June bearing cultivars. We have a really short harvest window Growers can only get 8,500 pounds per acre per year. And most of them sell to consumers via direct to market um, sales and they take advantage of agritourism with pick your own um, ventures so people can come pick their own strawberries, farmers markets, restaurants, farm stands, and supply really does not meet demand at the moment. So all this information so far kind of does beg the question, why do we still grow this way? 
And the answer to that is that it's generally easier to grow this way. So a lot of the farms that grow strawberries are diversified operations that grow other edible crops as well. So they like that these systems are low maintenance. They like that the strawberry season ends early and they can turn their attention to other crops. And they like that sometimes labor costs can be reduced by taking advantage of agritourism and having people come pick their own berries when they're specifically in season. There are also some lower input costs and the availability of equipment is different because with um, day neutral systems, you have to shape beds and you need specialized equipment like you can see in this picture on the right. There are also some other benefits in terms of the fact that June bears are done bearing by the time spotted wing drosophila are becoming problematic in the late summer and early fall. So in summary, there are many current strawberry growers in Minnesota who aren't necessarily interested in changing how they produce. And so that will become important later on when I talk a little bit about outreach and extension and how we kind of hope to increase berry production in Minnesota. So besides grower interest, what else stands in the way of increasing production in Minnesota? And the answer is that it's a lot of the usual factors that come along with growing in a relatively harsh northern climate. So like I mentioned before, there are weeds and pathogens because strawberries are so non-competitive. There are also winter temperatures. So Minnesota is in USDA zones three and four, and that means the annual low temperatures can get down to negative 40 degrees C. There's also the fact that strawberries prefer rich, well-draining soil, and most of those favorable soil types in Minnesota are being used for monoculture crops like corn or soybeans. And there are also issues with labor. So labor is expensive, season extension can divert labor from other crops, and harvest takes a long time and is really hard on your body. So just to summarize conventional cropping systems, strawberry demand is way up in the last 40 years or so, and so growers can really profit from season extension. That being said, June bearing PMR systems continue to dominate, and so increasing production is pretty challenging for a lot of different reasons, including the fact that some current strawberry growers are not necessarily interested in changing how they produce. So what are some alternative systems that we really hope could help with this? I'm gonna talk a little bit about CEA or controlled environment agriculture. And a lot of people think of controlled environment agriculture as being really high tech, specifically greenhouse growing, but actually controlled environment agriculture techniques can have a pretty broad range of applications. And it really just works on the basis of creating and controlling favorable microclimate conditions for growing strawberries. So at the lower end of the spectrum um, of control for strawberry growings, we have raised beds which manipulate drainage and can use plastic to warm the soil and increase vigor and, and allow us to grow a little bit earlier. We also have low tunnels, which do similar things. They can raise the temperature around the plants. And as you start coming up to the higher end of control, we have high tunnels, which help to raise temperatures, prevent rain damage. And then we have greenhouses where you have almost total control. So some of the new production systems, um, these systems have been tested pretty extensively at the U during Andy Petran's work with Emily Hoover and Steve Poppy, and frequently they rely on those microenvironments and that kind of controlled environment agriculture. So they use day neutral strawberries and we manage them annually to maximize yield. We use raised beds for better drainage, and then we use drip irrigation to feed nutrients right to the root zone. And we put plastic over the, that drip irrigation to warm the soil and prevent evaporation. And this is allowed for expansion in organic production. So in this photo on the right, I believe this is a trial in Morris. And you can see um, these really beautiful rows of plastic culture and the low tunnels over the top to help um, extend the season for the day neutrals that are gonna be planted in those rows. So the next step in the progression toward more highly controlled and managed um, production is hydroponics. So this can be sometimes a bit of a controversial term and it can be very broad. So I'm gonna say here that, that this definition is the process of growing plants in sand, gravel, or liquid with added nutrients, but without soil. So for our purposes, we tend to define it as any soilless system that uses a flow of fertilizer solution to deliver nutrients to plants. 
And there are two main types of hydroponic systems that we use for growing strawberries. The first is nutrient film technique, and that uses bare-rooted plant or bare-rooted transplants, and the roots are suspended directly into nutrient solution. That solution is pumped in from a reservoir, it flows down a channel to bathe the roots, and then it can be recirculated. However, there's no real buffering capacity with this type of system, so nutrients, acidity, and salinity levels have to be pretty much spot on perfect at all times, so they have to be very highly regulated. There, are also drip there is also drip substrate technique, and in this system, the roots of the plants are anchored in some type of soilless media, and the preferred media type really differs a lot actually depending on region and country. So for instance, rock wool tends to be preferred in Europe, whereas in the US we use more peat and perlite and sawdust and ground bark are really common in Canada because they can be sourced locally. In this situation, nutrient solution is again pumped through lines directly into the media. And in this system, the solution isn't always recirculated, but there is actually a better buffering capacity because the roots are not um, suspended directly into the nutrient solution. So tabletop systems can be a little bit on the borderline of hydroponics because depending on the type of media you're using, some nutrition can be derived from the media. So we say that tabletops make use of a drip substrate technique because the principle and the techniques are the same for drip sub or are the same for tabletop strawberries as for drip substrate systems. I'm just really going to quickly mention aquaponics, which is the integration of hydroponics and fish raising. So the idea here is that fish waste provides nutrients and the plants filter the water. So Marie Abbey did her work on this in 2018 for her master's thesis, and she found that her berries were pretty good. They were a little bit small and had kind of a high water content. And there were some issues that are common to greenhouse growing. So there was iron chlorosis as a problem. Um, obviously, it might harm the fish to add extra iron to the water. And so that could be something in the future that could be mitigated with foliar sprays. There were also some problematic pests, such as spider mites and fungal pathogens. And of course, whenever you're growing inside, you have to be aware of the lack of indoor pollinators. Strawberries actually need insect pollination to reach max acane fertilization and maximum fruit fill. So just to quickly summarize alternative cropping systems, most of them use, or pretty much all of them use, day neutral cultivars and manage them as annuals. Controlled environment agriculture techniques have proven effective. And day neutral production has been on the rise and has improved a lot because of previous University of Minnesota research. And hydroponics are becoming increasingly common. Tabletops rely on modified hydroponic techniques. So we finally arrive at tabletop systems specifically. So something that a lot of people don't necessarily know because um, tabletop can be a little bit of a misnomer actually, is that tabletop growing doesn't necessarily need actual tables. Um, it tends to be an umbrella term that refers mainly to growing strawberries at table height. And as a system, it was developed in the Netherlands in the 1970s and has since spread and become common across Northern Europe, Asia, and Canada. And it has now allowed for year-round local production in the Netherlands and Belgium. Most of that production takes place in greenhouses, but the systems are occasionally used outdoors. So now I'm gonna, we're gonna look really quickly at how diverse some of the systems under the tabletop umbrella can be. So these are gutter systems, and this is the system that we'll be using in our study. On the left, you can see a greenhouse in the Netherlands, and you can see how they have these galvanized steel gutters, and then they've made um, really clever use of the space that they have available by putting grow bags on the ground as well as in the gutters. On the right is a University of Arizona um, strawberry growing project that they've been working on for a while, and you can see that they're planting directly into the gutters with a layer of landscape fabric in between. These are bucket systems, which are a little bit self-explanatory. You put the media into the buckets and then plant the strawberries into the media. And then these systems can either, or the buckets can either be set onto a table or a bench, or they can be suspended from the ceiling of a greenhouse. 
There are also tower slash vertical systems. These are frequently used in greenhouses, but they can also be used in high tunnels to maximize vertical space, since um, growing strawberries in high tunnels can sometimes be a little space inefficient because strawberries are so low lying. We also have wall mounted gutters. So these might be more suited for home gardeners or for growers who are interested in using unconventional spaces. I was talking to Emily recently and she was saying that maybe she should put some on the side of her garage. So we'll have to see if she does that and how it goes for her. And finally, we have A-frame structures. So the picture on the left here is actually from a previous season at the Boreal Farm outside Duluth. So it came from Caroline Hegstrom, who's the owner operator there. And she had tried this system in a previous year, but she didn't actually have a drip irrigation system. Um, so she's looking to try it again this season and I've been in touch with her and I'm really excited to hear how it goes for her. So of course, there are some challenges to this system. And a lot of them come down to the lack of soil buffering capacity. So acidity, acidity and salinity have a huge impact on the bioavailability of nutrients and have to be really closely monitored. So especially for salinity or salts in the soil, keeping the media uniformly moist can help. And we do flush the system with plain tap water as needed. There are also some issues with water and temperature because being at elevation makes them more sensitive to temperature fluctuations and to evaporation. However, they can be easy to cover with rain shelters or plastic, so that could potentially be mediated that way. There are issues with nutrient availability. So before you were to try to use a system like this, you'd have to get your source water actually tested and then tailor your nutrient solution to the local water. And of course, not having any soil means there are no soil derived elements. And then there are, of course, economics. So this kind of system has a higher startup cost than a lot of other systems. And there is, of course, the necessity for specialized knowledge. Of course, there are also some really interesting novel advantages of this system. And it's kind of the inverse of no soil, that there are fewer issues that are associated with soil. So there's no weed pressure. There's really no seed bank to fight. And the only weeds that happen in these systems are those that were blown in, and they're pretty easy to pull out because you're doing it from a standing position. Which kind of brings us naturally to the fact that labor is less demanding, so harvest is easier from an upright standing position, and studies have shown that harvesting this way reduces musculoskeletal disorders in laborers. There's also minimal pest pressure, so there's no overwintering of pests and pathogens in soil, and so tabletop systems has, can see a pretty big reduction in fungicide and pesticide use. There is the indoor-outdoor adaptability and that really broad range of infrastructure that can be used with a system like this. And some of those systems are portable, so they can be moved around season to season, depending on what is most convenient for the grower. And alongside that, these systems can be easy to cover. So they can be constructed in high tunnels, you can put them under rain shelters, and of course, in the case of really inclement weather, if you're using troughs in a gutter like we are, the plants are very easy to lift and bring inside. These systems can also be set up on marginal land. So this could be a major boon to urban growers or to community gardens because poor soil really won't be an issue with this kind of system. And this could open up areas for production that may have soil contamination problems, such as former industrial sites, former gas stations, parking lots, et cetera. So just to do a quick summary of tabletops. These systems are already common elsewhere. They were invented in the Netherlands, but has since spread across Northern Europe and into Canada and parts of Asia. So they do have a proven track record in different parts of the world. They do have some specialized challenges. Learning hydroponic techniques definitely will not be for every grower, but they are also extremely adaptable. So they're potentially suitable for a lot of currently unoccupied production niches. And there are a lot of novel advantages that are kind of associated with elevated soilless production. So now I'm going to walk through the design layout treatments, but also the construction of this system for my experimental design. So in terms of the rationale for this work, this should again be pretty familiar by now. There's a high demand for local produce, including strawberries. And we can see these premium off-season prices for growers during that 14-week day neutral production window. 
and even advanced systems do have challenges with expensive specialized machinery, as well as soil-borne diseases, weeds, temperature, and labor issues. And tabletop systems, we're hoping, could provide some interesting solutions to some of these problems. So the project objectives are therefore to expand day-neutral strawberry production in Minnesota, expand Minnesota's growers' access to the market for specialty fruit crops, add to current knowledge about season extension in Minnesota, educate growers about different systems and the different options for season extension that they have, hopefully increase grower incomes derived from local production, and of course, meet that high demand from consumers for local strawberries later in the year. So we have three study locations, one in St. Paul, one at the West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris, Minnesota, and then we have two grower cooperators. So on the St. Paul campus, if you have been driving along Bortner near the plant growth facility, um, you may have noticed this kind of space agey looking steel structure, and that is the tabletop system. Um, at WC Rock, you can see that they have managed to get their plants into the system this year. And so Steve Poppy and Nate Dahlman have been really responsible for the work there and have been doing a wonderful job, um, particularly Steve, who's been growing strawberries for a long time and knows absolutely everything there is to know. And then we also have our really wonderful grower cooperators at Ida Valley Farm and Twin Cities Berry Co. So the Ways and Andy Petran have been really great partners for us. In terms of materials, we have two day neutral cultivars and two media types. On the left here are the Albion strawberries, and on the right here are Cabrillo. And then we are using the Berger OM6 media type, which is a pretty conventional peat and perlite blend. And then the BM4, which is a more sustainable organic wood fiber and bark blend. So in terms of how we chose our cultivars, um, we chose both of them because they are day neutral strawberries that we will manage as annuals. Um, Albion is a cultivar that's been around for a little while and that we've used before at the University of Minnesota. So we know that it performs well. Some quick characteristics, um, they have large fruit, they have good flavor, which is evidenced by the fact that they have high total soluble solids, which is a measure of sugar content. And they are resistant to verticillium wilt, phytophthora, oops, phytophthora crown rot, and anthracnose crown rot. Cabrillo is actually a newer day neutral variety, so we're excited to be trying it out. And they're supposed to have really high productivity, large firm fruit, which is good for post harvest shelf life, good flavor, and they should be moderately resistant to powdery mildew, verticillium wilt by top throat crown rot and common leaf spot. However, they may be moderately susceptible to anthracnose crown rot. So we're gonna be keeping an eye on that, of course. So in terms of the rest of our materials for this system, these systems can be prefabricated or they can be home built like you saw the Canadian growers on the first slide. There was a little bit of debate, I understand before um, the research for this system really got going about whether we wanted to try to build our own system, but ultimately we did go with a prefabricated meteor system. So those gutters are on the far left, and then you can see our plastic troughs that the plants actually get planted into. And then you can see our fertigation system and our drip irrigation system. So the actual experimental layout for this trial is a fully randomized and balanced two by two factorial design, meaning that we have each combination of the two cultivars and the two media randomly ordered into 24 identical plastic troughs. It's balanced because there's an equal number of six replicates per treatment. And this is actually um, one long 80 foot row. So trough 13 picks up where trough 12 ends. But as I'm sure you can imagine, it's a little difficult to make a schematic for something that's so long and skinny as an 80 foot row. And there is with this system, a low grade slope from one end to the other. So the fertigation board is at the higher end of the system and the leachate bucket is at the lower end because strawberries are susceptible to crown and root rot. And so we want to make sure that the um, solution is flowing evenly through the system and not lingering anywhere. And you can see as well that the orange boxes um, correspond to the OM6 media type. 
and the blue boxes co correspond to the VM4 media type. So this is a cross section of the system that I made recently because again, it can be really helpful to try to, to look at it visually and try to conceptualize this system. So the bottom here, there's the support pole and that is what holds up this galvanized steel gutter. The media is set into these black plastic troughs and then the strawberries are planted into the soilless media. The troughs are then set into the steel gutter. We have two drip irrigation lines, one on each side of the system. So one is designated for the OM6 media type and the other is designated for the BM4 media type. The emitters deliver the nutrient solution directly to the root zone. And then there are holes punched in the bottom of the trough so the leachate can drain out of the media and into the drainage channel. And then the drainage channel empties into the bucket. And so we can dispose of it responsibly. So just a tiny bit about our pilot study. We did experience some pretty significant COVID related delays. So we were really lucky to have Lindsay Miller who's pictured here who got everything coordinated and set up for us and really made sure that everything did arrive at all of the sites. This is a photo from the day that we built the system in St. Paul in late September. So in terms of construction, we had to drive the poles really kind of plumb and even or else the system can actually buckle under its own weight when you set the plants into it. And again, to prevent root rot, we had a quarter inch drop between poles for that low grade slope. I wish I could say that we had a really scientific method for achieving that, but it really was measuring the poles and then it was a little bit of string and guesswork, um, but it worked out well in the end. And then the gutter actually came delivered in pieces. So the pieces had to be bolted together and then we had to caulk them really carefully to make sure there was not gonna be any runoff. And again, that way we can collect all the leachate in a bucket so we can dispose of it responsibly. Um, we aren't actually reusing the solution for this system because that does require some um, pasteurization and rebalancing for nutrients and things like that. And that's not necessarily a realistic expectation for the growers who are interested in the system. You can see here the finished products. So on the left, we have the system without plants in St. Paul because of those COVID shipping delays. But you can see on the right, Moore's got their plants all set in and they're looking really great. So in terms of media and plant prep, when our media arrived, we had to hydrate it and then set it into the troughs so it could settle before the transplants were planted into it. We had a bit of an adventure to get a hold of our media. I believe at one point one bale flew off the back of a truck. So thank goodness for the people who really bravely delivered these materials during the pandemic last summer. When our plants arrived, we trimmed off any dead tissue and we potted them up into plug trays. Um, we had to pot them up into plug trays because the system was late in arriving, but it ended up being quite lucky because we had some extras then and we could fill in any plants that didn't survive the transplant into the troughs. So winterizing and storage feels like a smaller consideration for us as researchers, but it's actually very consequential for growers. And luckily it is pretty low maintenance. So we just composted our plants in media. And as I mentioned before, we manage everything as annuals. Um, we can't propagate the Albina and Cabrillo plants because they're patented by UC Davis. And you can see here on the right how root bound they were by the end of the season. So then we did clean out the troughs with a Clorox solution and store them inside because plastic gets really brittle in the cold. But the galvanized steel gutter could stay outside because it can withstand really harsh winter conditions, um, which is pretty obvious here after we got a pretty big snowstorm in St. Paul, it was still looking just as good as it did the, the day that we put it together. So in terms of strawberry management, this is what we did during the pilot season and what we plan to continue to do for subsequent seasons. So we watered and fertilized once per day using a proprietary J.R. Peters trial blend. We monitored for acidity and salinity in the solution and leachate to maintain correct levels. We did find that we had high water pH at the WC rock site in Morris, which led to some issues with plant growth that we hope to remedy next season. We also took several leaf tissue samples, which helped us determine that we had a magnesium deficiency in St. Paul, but that was pretty easily remedied by adding Epsom salts to our solution for the remainder of the season. 
We harvested two to three times per week as necessary, and we removed dead and dying plant material and runners throughout the season. So we will be evaluating our cultivars based on total yield and yield per plant via weight in grams and number of fruit. We'll be looking at plant health via tissue analysis. And like I mentioned before, during our pilot season that already helped us to develop or to determine and correct nutritional deficiencies that we had. We'll also be looking at fruit quality via the proportion of marketable versus non-marketable fruit. And for us, non-marketable fruit is really anything that is so damaged by insects, rain, diseases, et cetera, that it would not be edible. And then we also looked at total soluble solids via BRICS measurements, which is a measure of sugar content. Um, so I ended up squishing a lot of berries in my living room this fall, which you can see on the right here, um, to extract the juice to test for the levels of sugar. And then we will also be keeping an eye on pests and diseases. We didn't have any issues during the pilot season, thankfully. So harvest efficiency is a bit of a secondary experiment that we're still working on developing. But at the moment, the plan is essentially to assess the efficiency of harvesting from a standing position. And to do that, we will look at how long harvest takes for each of our 80 foot rows in St. Paul and Morris. That data will be compared to previous harvest data, timing or harvest data um, that was collected in Morris in 2014. That data came from 10 100 foot rows of day neutral cultivars that were managed in ground using plastic culture. And you can see in this picture that they had five rows that had low tunnels and five rows without. So we plan to compare our data only to the rows without low tunnels since we aren't using any kind of protective structures on our system. And then the project will ultimately be evaluated based on yield compared to other in ground day neutral systems as well as perennial matted road dune bearing systems, labor efficiency compared to in-ground denatural systems, overall fruit quality via marketable and non-marketable fruit, and economic viability. We do hope to look at this data later on in the project to assess the timing for growers in terms of when they might be able to see a return on their investment. And then we will also keep track of the number of growers that we reached out to throughout the season and um, keep an eye on that through our outreach and extension efforts from all of the different researchers on this project. So to kind of come back around to our target demographic, since we aren't sure that a lot of current strawberry growers will be interested in this system, um, this is really based on feedback and informal conversations that we've already had with growers. And um, the first group of people that we think might find the system attractive are berry growers who are new to growing strawberries. So for instance, we've talked to some raspberry and blueberry growers who are already growing in high tunnels and are interested in expanding into strawberries. One of the really major concerns for a lot of June brain growers is SWD flies. And so many other small fruit growers are less put off by SWD flies, not because they aren't very destructive, because they are, but because they're already managing for them. So introducing a season extending strawberry wouldn't also introduce a new pest to their farms. We also think that urban growers could be good candidates. So this is actually a photo from an urban farm in Detroit where I previously worked. And while they had their soil tested regularly and they didn't have any issues with contamination on the main site pictured here, they did also own um, a vacant lot across the street that used to be a gas station. And so they could only grow non-edible crops or use raised beds there. So this kind of system could be a really great option for um, a farm like that that's looking to really take advantage of um, as much urban space as possible. And then we also think that any farmers who are really just looking to experiment could be interested in this because a lot of farmers are interested in hydroponics, but since greenhouses and big hydroponic systems are expensive, this could be a good way for them to try them out at a slightly lower cost. So outreach and extension are very important to us for this project. And some of our work with growers has already taken place in the form of direct contact, such as emails and phone conversations, local conference presentations, such as the talk that I gave for the Minnesota Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association in January, as well as blog posts on the human extension website, like this one here that was written by Nate Dahlman, who works at Morris. 
And then we will also have some more formal extension events. So I helped to facilitate um, a webinar where Steve Poppy and Annie Claude, our extension educator, were the main speakers and they were delivering this webinar about denutrile strawberry production systems in general. And then I'm very excited that in October, Annie and I will host a webinar where we'll be talking about the results from our first year of study. Unfortunately, we don't really have any farm tours planned due to COVID-19 considerations. So final summary and conclusions. The main project objective is season extension for strawberry growing in Minnesota. And we're hoping to enhance economic benefits for growers and help them meet high demand from consumers. We'll be doing this via testing the efficacy of an outdoor tabletop strawberry growing system to overcome current production challenges. And we will be assessing the system based on yield, fruit quality, economic viability, and labor efficiency. And outreach and extension are really high priority for us in this project. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my advisors and my committee member, um, Emily Hoover, Neil Anderson, and Carl Rosen, as well as the really incredible researchers on this project. So Lindsay Miller, who this really wouldn't have been possible without, as well as Nate Dahlman and Steve Poppy. And then our outreach and extension experts, Emily Tepe and Annie Claude, our grower cooperators, The Ways and Andy Petran, and then the members of the Anderson and Smith Labs as well as all of my friends and family who joined us today um, to learn about my graduate work. I hope that it was interesting for them. Um, and then of course, none of this work would have been possible at all without the funding and the material support of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, the Minnesota Agricultural Experiment Station, as well as Berger, Beto, Meteor, and J.R. Peters. Um, and all of my references for everything that I included in this work can be found at the end of this presentation. And so with that, I would love to take questions. Thank you, Kate, for that wonderful presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A box already. Um, if you would like me to read them to you, I'd be happy to, or um, if you wanna pull it up and read it yourself, either works. I might need you to read them to me, actually. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the first question is from Rebecca, and they ask, will it be possible to implement agritourism and allow for pick your own with these systems? And I actually had the same question too. Yeah, I think that that could be possible. I think that um, from a marketing perspective, it might be interesting, um, kind of on two sides. On one side, it is kind of a novel, interesting thing that people won't have seen before, and it will be really easy for them to pick their own. I do think that um, on the flip side, a lot of people do have a strong association with June as the time when they go out and pick strawberries. So, you know, they might just not be looking as much to pick strawberries in, you know, July or August, but I think that with enough concerted effort from, from growers, if they're interested in in taking advantage of pick your own strawberries, they absolutely, they absolutely could, yeah. Interesting. Um, another question is, do you anticipate any pollinator problems by extending the growing season? I don't think so, no. Um, one of the big benefits is that we're doing this outside. And so, you know, in the same way that there aren't necessarily pollinator issues with other kind of late bearing crops, like, you know, fall raspberries or blueberries, I don't necessarily think that that should be a problem for us, thankfully. I currently don't see any other questions in the I chat. Have, I have one. This is Don. Okay. Hi, Don. Hi. Uh, so, so you're taking the leachate and just putting it in a pail. Is there an opportunity to actually do nitrogen and phosphorus use efficiency in this in this work? You know, so... in terms of nutrients in and the nutrients in the pail? Is there a way of 
of looking at the efficiency of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium use in the system? You know, I'm sure there would be. Um, that's not necessarily something that we are going to be doing for this particular project, but I'm sure that there is other work out there that addresses that for, for other drip substrate hydroponic systems. Um, you know, something that I think is important to keep in mind with this system is that while it is relatively new for Minnesota and kind of for the upper Midwest and and smaller growers in particular, we aren't really reinventing the wheel with this um, because hydroponic systems have been used, you know, since the 1970s um, and are widespread in other places. So I'm sure that actually that information does exist elsewhere. And that's probably part of why it's not necessarily something that we're going to address um, in this particular project. But that's I was just wondering though, if maybe it would be a real easy thing to do, even though it isn't a primary focus of the research you know again I don't know enough about that but I was just uh, just suggesting uh, that your team might want to think about that and see whether or not it, it would be a researchable question that could be added yeah absolutely I will write that down and I'm sure that Carl Rosen will have lots of um Carl yeah, Carl. yeah interesting opinions about that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Kate, I have a question. How does the density of these tabletop strawberries compare to strawberries that are grown um, as day neutrals in raised beds? Is the like number of plants per acre a lot smaller or a lot greater compared to a more it standard is, system? It is much greater. It's about 81 plants per meter squared. Um, so <laughs> Practically, they are really packed in there. The um, meter or the troughs are a meter long, and there are nine plants per trough. And so, you know, practically, what that means is that we are probably looking at lower yield per plant. But because they are so packed in there, um, other studies have shown that these systems do tend to have a higher yield per acre um, because you can fit so many so many plants in. Um, so we we have yet to see whether that. Um, is the case for us, but hopefully. I don't mean to be hung up on nutrients. This is Don again. Uh, in, in how, how much does it cost to supply the nutrients for this system? Um, the cost per, uh, per plant or cost per unit area? To be completely honest I mean, with in you, terms of what is what is the cost? You know, obviously the the infrastructure cost is up front, right? Once you get it in place, but in terms of the cost of the plants, the cost of the nutrients, the cost of labor, you know, you're focused on labor, but what are some of the other costs? I would imagine that the cost of the plants is pretty high, right? I mean, I think the cost of the plants isn't isn't particularly high in comparison to the cost of the system itself. So I know that when we've talked about um, when we've talked about the fact that we have to kind of replace the plants every season, um, you know that hasn't been a major concern for everybody in our budget. Um, and in terms of the nutrients, I will say that the J.R. Peters trial blend that we're using was donated. Um, but if you like, I can definitely look up the particulars about how much we are spending on. Um, the plants every season, I think it's not more than a couple hundred dollars. Um, but yeah, I can look that up specifically for you. Well, I was just thinking in that. terms of the overall, you know, financial framework for a system like this, mm -hmm. is thinking where the costs were, were well, in the system. Right? Yeah, I will say that in terms of, you know, things like fungicides, pesticides, um, herbicides that can be really expensive. This system does cut costs in that regard because you don't really need those as frequently, hopefully. And there are some costs that tend to be annual costs with day neutral in ground systems that are potentially eliminated. So you wouldn't really, you know, once you install the system, you have it. So you don't necessarily need to rent, you know, specialized bed shapers in the future. You don't necessarily have to put out the money for, you know, landscape fabric and for the low tunnel plastic and things like that in the way that you would in some other day neutral production systems. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Of course. 
Hey, there is another question in the chat. Um, and this is any data on flavor of berries grown in these systems versus in the field? We actually thus far, it seems like if I remember correctly, based on some previous research that was done in Canada, I don't think that um, flavor differed substantively, but actually fruit quality was increased in systems like this because um, you know, the fruit are actually, because they're elevated, they're never actually getting, you know, in the soil, they're very clean. Um, and they tend to suffer less rain damage and they also suffer, you know, less pest damage. So there's less insect predation, um, which I imagine would also do maybe something for the flavor. Um, we were, you know, taking our bricks measurements and we did find that the sugar content increased throughout the season in all of our berries, which is apparently quite common for strawberries. But um, I can say personally that the fruit that uh, I was eating in October was really incredible. It was some of the best strawberries I'd ever had actually, but um, that's not scientifically proven necessarily. So don't quote me on that in that regard. <laughs> 